welcome back. Uh, today we're thrilled to talk about informational interviews, how to get them, how to give them, how to make them a part of your day-to-day -day life. Uh, what else, Sherry? That's right, Mandy. In addition to hearing from our guest speaker, Brittany Partridge, you will also be sharing your own experience as an interview grantor. Then Brittany will be reviewing how she developed a system for informational interviews to help her drive her career. So Mandy, tell us a little bit about how you saw a student leverage her informational interview with you to get an internship. And you've stayed in touch with her and become a long-term mentor, right? Yeah, so I actually have students and young professionals uh, reach out to me all the time. In fact, uh, I just gave a couple informational interviews yesterday to some students from my alma mater that were in town and, you know, wanted to pick my brain. Um, but there was one particular young woman that I gave an informational interview with that I was just blown away with her persistence and her professionalism, and it really stuck out from everybody else. Um, from our first informational interview, I actually went on to recommend her to my HR and recruiting team for a, an open internship position. Um, and then after she was actually hired on, I became an advocate for her throughout her entire internship and as she got brought on full time. So we actually stay in touch even now. I'm no longer with the same agency. Uh, we're actually at competitor agencies, <laughs> but you know, we're, we still maintain that relationship. And um, I'm really excited to, to hear what Brittany has to share with us a little bit more about informational interviews and how to kind of incorporate that into your daily life. Well, thanks, Mandy, that's terrific. And, and I love the tools that Brittany is going to be discussing. In addition, another mechanism that I was impressed with is that she's leveraged leadership positions in her professional association. But just to give everybody a little bit of background, I'm Sherry T. Bell. I'm the founding advisor uh, for this program, Build Her. I'm also the CEO at Metagram. And our mission is to save lives by reducing time to treatment and enabling physicians to communicate on mobile wherever they are so that they can improve patient outcomes and improve financial performance for hospitals. I'm delighted to be interviewing today a leader in the applied health informatics field, Brittany Partridge from Ascension Connect Health. So hi, Brittany. Hey, Sherry. Thanks for having me, having me on today. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, so my first question is, can you tell us briefly what applied informatics is? and a summary of your role at Ascension, as well as a bit about your company. I'll, I'll just preface that by saying that I think a lot of us are gonna be seeing jobs that we've never heard of before. And so why not start with a friend that we have that's- um, So my best definition of applied informatics is that I sit at the intersection of technology and clinical workflow. So every time we roll out a new technology or a new upgrade or optimization, my job is to make sure that it fits best with the clinical workflow, it doesn't impede patient care, and then it also highlights our clinicians' successes. So if they're really doing something well, like they've come up with a new care process or they've reduced readmissions, um, I help make sure that the data is there to be able to report that success, um, as well as any reporting requirements that we might need um, for legislation or anything like that. And then for my role right now, I work for Ascension Connect as of about a week and a half ago. Um, so Ascension Connect falls under the health, Ascension Health umbrella, and Ascension Health is a nationwide healthcare system. But Ascension Connect focuses on three pillars. So the first one is virtual care and innovation, um, and those are things like telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. Um, the second one is access, which are things like centralized scheduling or using Lyft, for example, to get our patients to their appointments if they can't get there themselves. And then hospital services are things like remotely monitoring patients' heart rhythms with our telemetry group or um, our command center, which helps our patients transfer in and out of the system, no matter where they are in the world. We've actually like, took one in from Germany the other day. And then the primary goal of Ascension Connect is getting the patients the care they need when they need it by meeting them where they are, no matter where that is, and using the technology to be able to get to them. Yeah, that, that's a lot. And, and you, you guys have 2,600 sites and 150 hospitals and you know thousands of clinicians. So that's a lot of operations and logistics and workflow, right? Yes, I am always busy for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thank you, thank you for sharing that about your role and, and, and the company that you're with. 
and, and I was also impressed um, when you shared your methodology and, and how you, you know, set up and go about managing informational interviews. And, and we shared the value, you know, both wanting to respect our mentors' time. And I know we both try to build that in um, to when we do our informational interviews. And, and so can you briefly walk through how you go about it, um, what you ask of the mentor? Um, uh, okay, sure. So just backing up a little bit to my first foray into informational interviews. Um, my dad was actually a professor and he has very strong visions for his students. So when I was about to graduate, he gave me homework assignments and one of them was to do three informational interviews. And when I found out what an informational interview was, basically I would say cold calling um, someone that's in your field that has um, expertise in something that you want to learn about, the introvert in me was like, absolutely not, I'm not doing that ever. And eventually it wore, it wore me down and I did my first three interviews. And now it's something I completely advocate for. I think it's very important to everyone's careers, um, but I know it can be a little nerve wracking at the beginning. And so my process is pretty simple, but I think it's important to have a framework just to kind of set yourself up for success. So the first thing I do is to find a person that I might want an informational interview with. Um, I use either LinkedIn or Twitter, or sometimes um, a mentor will point someone out to me that would be a good connection, or I see a presentation. And then I go ahead and reach out to them, um, either through LinkedIn, if that's all that I have, or I try to send them an email, if possible. And, and during, when you're sending that message, I think it's really important to be really clear about your intentions of why you want to meet with that person. So I try to send them a very succinct email saying, these are the two questions that I'd like to answer with your time. Um, I'd like to just have 15 minutes if possible. And this is who I am and why I wanna meet with you. And as someone that started receiving requests for informational interviews, I really see it as important to know why we're meeting and how I can help you because sometimes they just say, oh, I'd like to meet with you or, oh, can you advise me on informatics? And that's really hard for both sides because you're not really sure how to frame it to help them and they're not really sure what they need. So just being really clear about that. And I'm also a huge proponent of that 15 minute time box when you get started. Um, if, it's, if it goes well, you can always have follow up interviews, have more time together. But that 15 minutes at first, it kind of gives those leaders you know, a constrained time box. They know they can fit 15 minutes onto their calendar and it gives them a way out. And then just make sure you stick that 15 minutes. Don't make it an hour when you tell them it's going to be 15. Um, and then one other thing. So a lot of times, you know, we're virtual, digital. We meet people all over the world. But if they happen to be in your area, I strongly recommend in person. So maybe bring them a coffee to their work um, or meet them for coffee. My actual best informational interview was over breakfast tacos. So there's really no limit to uh, where you meet. Well, that, that, those are great tips. I love that. And, and I would love to hear some of the success you had because one of the things you shared with me is that a lot of your career path has been leveraged or based on these informational interviews. So help help the help our audience understand a little bit more about you know what some of the great results you've had. Sure. So um, I honestly would say that I owe my career to informational interviews um, because I'm an informaticist. Usually applied informatics requires an RN or an MD degree. I don't have either one of those. Um, however, I got an informational interview with a leader in clinical informatics, um, who's actually now my boss, <laughs> but previously, um, I had been connected to her through my uncle. He said that she'd be a great person to know. So I reached out to her um, following that framework that I mentioned before, and we met at Starbucks and I talked to her about what clinical informatics was and what types of personality traits and skills a clinical informaticist needed. And she really liked what I had to say. Um, and so she actually introduced me to the hiring manager of the physician training team for clinical informatics, which led to a hiring interview. And the reason I say that kind of boosted my career was because if I had applied the traditional way, um, a lot of times computers are the first screeners. And because I didn't have the RN or MD, the computer would have booted me out. But because she was able to introduce me to that uh, hiring manager, that's how I got my start in clinical informatics. And I feel like clinical informatics is my thing. Like, I love it. And I never could have gotten there. This is my thing. Like, I love it. And I never could have gotten there without it. Um, so that's why I always like to say they really boost my career. But um, a couple other ways that I've really had success with informational interviews um, are two things. So one, um, helping to find mentors. So either short-term or long-term mentors. 
and then also breaking through roadblocks um, for projects. So sometimes I think people don't think about this when they're doing informational interviews, they're just thinking about career growth. But a lot of times um, there will be people around in different companies that have done the projects that you've done. They know the problems that you're running into and reaching out to them to see how they overcame them has been a really big bonus for me with informa informational interviews. So for example, um, the CMIO at UCLA, he and I met through AMIA and I was really struggling with intake governance for clinical informatics and I just couldn't figure out how to get it to work. And so I reached out to him to talk about it because I knew he had just stood it up over this past year. And I mean, he was great. He shared all his flow charts, his diagrams, his charters for different meetings. And I mean, he made my job a lot easier because I could just use what he had. So that's been pretty great. Briefly what intake is just because we have a lot of people who aren't. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, this is not just clinical informatics, but intake governance, and I'm sure you see it in pretty much every tech world ever. Um, when someone wants something optimized or they want a new piece of software or they there's a bug that they want fixed, but it's not a bug that's causing major issues. Um, there's a long line of people that have all these thoughts and changes that they want. So they all submit these requests and you get way more than you have the resources or time to do. And trying to make sure that you're fair about your decision making, that you're doing the best thing for the patients or your clients if you're in technology, um, how you're gonna score those requests, how you're gonna resource those requests, that whole governance process is a big hurdle, pretty much I would say everywhere um, and just getting it better and better. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and that's right on with, with technology company, you know, requests, change requests, <laughs> the, yeah. the universal pain. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so which interview grantors in particular, if you have examples of a couple that you've stayed in touch with and, and how do you go about staying in touch? I mean, we're all busy, you know, and it's easy to kind of get focused and we, and we should, be, should be focused, you know, on our schedule and, and our work streams. So how, how do you figure out, you know, um, how to, you know, make the time and, and get, get in touch with, with those people that, that have made time for you in the past. Sure. So the first thing that I would say is after every informational interview, the first one that you have, make sure you write a thank you note. And I know that seems pretty basic, um, but I cannot overstate how important that is. Um, and if you can, handwrite it. So I've always been a handwritten thank you note type of person. And it's not like a hiring interview where that thank you needs to get there automatically, like right then, so you do the email. But with an informational interview, just take that time to do the handwritten note. Um, admin assistance can really help you if you need that uh, address, but I had no idea how much of an impact it made. And I actually had an informational interview with the president um, of a healthcare cybersecurity firm. And I sent him a thank you note right afterwards. And he actually sent me a thank you note back for my thank you note because he was so surprised and excited of, to get one. Um, and so I keep that note on my desk to just remind me how much um, just a little note of thanks and gratitude can go such a long way. Um, but beyond that first thank you, I, um, I'm a little bit of a nerd. So I keep an informational interview spreadsheet. And each time I interview someone, I put their name and their contact information on it. And then I put little notes about what we talked about. So if there was something they noted of interest or a project that they're currently working on, or even something totally unrelated to work, like they love Siamese cats. Or something. Um, I put that note in the informational interview spreadsheet, and then I try to follow up with them um, within three months for the first circle back. So I try, I look at my spreadsheet and it has the date of our informational interview. And I set a timer for three months out. Really, I love Excel. Um, and then I try to circle back with them within that time frame with just either sending them a link of a conference that they might be interested in or something I read that I thought related to their interest um, or even introducing them to someone else that I think might be able to help them with something they mentioned they were struggling with. Just kind of using that time frame to refresh in their mind that we had a good conversation and that, and that, that I, as the interview asker, can still be helpful. Um, I think a lot of times there's the perception that it's a favor to the asker, and yes, it is a little bit at the beginning, but once you kind of establish that relationship, I see it as a two-way street. So I've learned so much from the people that have asked me for informational interviews, and I think often trading back and forth that information can really keep the relationship going long term. And then um, after that, it, like it happens a little more organically once you do that first follow-up. 
but I try to keep an eye on it and connect with those that I want to be my long-term network um, every six months. That I learned was how, how to try to figure out to make sure that it gets to the right person. Um, because, you know, some of these organizations, you know, with mail rooms, you know, administrative staff, et cetera. And so one of my mentors had coached me to write a personal with an underline on the front and then also to follow up with the admin um, to make sure that the admin is able to retrieve it from the channels of mail and get it uh, to the person directly, handed to the person directly, uh, so that they can they can receive it. Because it, 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 it's best if they receive it, right? <laughs> um, how do you decide or identify who to ask, or and how do you become inspired um, to ask someone to grant you an informational interview? Interviews, I definitely kind of put myself in a box. I only was really asking uh, the people that had jobs that I was interested in and their hiring managers, mainly to kind of think about how I was gonna grow my career, where I was gonna go from there. Um, but as I kind of grew with my informational interview skills and, and how I was using them, I really started realizing that it didn't have to even be in my area of expertise. It could be in a totally different industry and I could learn things from them. Um, for example, like an industrial engineer from Toyota might have great processes for intake or um, someone over at the um, health sciences building totally unrelated to medical might have a great way to address a problem I was having. And so I really started to expand my asking. Um, and the ways that I really kind of find people to interview, so LinkedIn is a huge tool for me. Um, I think especially when you're getting started too, because it shows the whole history of someone. And it also shows what articles they post and ideas they have and comments they make. And so you can really find something to connect with and figure out how you're gonna ask them or what piece of their job you might wanna ask about. Um, so one of the biggest points that I use is I'm a huge proponent of building your network before you need it um, and making sure you have a strong peer group, a solid set of mentors and some subject matter experts that you cultivate and contact regularly before you actually need them. Because we all hit that day where we need to, have, we need to contact someone for a job recommendation or we really are running into something with a project and we need some advice for a critical turnaround. You wanna have that network already built, already cultivated, already relationships before you need them. And so I try to use informational interviews to do that. Um, so like I mentioned, LinkedIn, always. Um, Twitter, I've actually met a lot of really great people in real life from Twitter that have really helped me with my career and problems. Um, and then also um, after conferences. So speakers always put their information on their slides, right? And they love to connect about their presentations because they do so much preparation you do this talk and then it's over. And so I've noticed that my highest percentage of responses are often when I'm reaching out to uh, presenters on their topics of at a conference. Um, and the same thing with journal articles. So if I read a journal article that's really helpful, um, I'll look at the lead author and reach out to them that way. And so I really try to stay open to who I'm talking to. It doesn't have to be healthcare. Um, and just really trying to um, connect and share feedback. Outstanding. And, and if you were going to be advising, you know, young professional who ha hasn't done any informational interviews or, or even a, a or more mature professional who, who hasn't taken advantage of the benefits, how would you advise them that they get started? Sure. So first, I would say take a deep breath. It's okay. Like I was definitely that person when my dad first told me what they were thinking there is no way I'm going to reach out to someone cold and ask them these questions. I know it can be a little overwhelming. So if you haven't heard of informational interviews before, I know it can be a little bit intimidating, but I would recommend um, just knowing that it's a common practice. Professionals are asked for informational interviews all the time. They're not gonna be alarmed when you ask. Um, and then also just, I would say start with LinkedIn if you haven't ever done one, because like I mentioned, it really shows a person's entire background, um, all the different jobs they've had. They might've started back where you are, so you can kind of use that as common ground. But if that's still a little bit intimidating with you, I would say use your network that you have right now, either your mentor, and if you don't have one of those, go get one. I'm sure Build Her will talk about that later. But um, if you don't have one of those, then maybe just your boss or even a coworker and just say, hey, I'm really interested in this or I'm running into a problem with this. Um, do you know anyone that might be able to help me? And more, than, more often than not, people are very willing to introduce you to their friends, their network, 
I mean, you can kind of start that way. So have them introduce you to that person for the informational interview. And that kind of tries, it eases the anxiety of that first step. But after that, after you do your first one, it'll be great. Here's a little bit and, and just go back to sessions as part of AMIA um, to really progress in your career. And, and to Sure. So I cannot overstate how important it is to find your professional home. Um, for some people, that can be a huge international organization like AMIA. But um, it can be a local chapter, I'm sure he's in charge of him, so talk to her, um, or even a group internal to your company can be options, but just finding that professional location that even as you move roles and even companies, that stays co constant and helps you and grows your relationships for your whole career. Um, just having that consistency, I think, really helps um, and having people that have known you from the beginning. Um, so yes, AMIA is very large. Um, the way that I kind of broke into it and made it my home um, is I first joined as a student. And that's always wonderful if you're a student, a grad student too, if you've just started going back to school um, because you get great discounts. It's really a lot cheaper to join as a student. And then also you get opportunities to go to like conferences as you volunteer. And so for things that I could have never afforded to fly to, um, I got a discount because I was a student. And then early on, I just really thought, okay, I think this is the match for me. I'm going to grow my career by volunteering for all the different opportunities that this um, organization has. And I think the biggest example of this in my life um, is the AMIA Policy Summit. So they put out a call for um, scribes, basically, to scribe a meeting that they were having in Washington um, about different technology policy and how it would relate to different bills that were being passed. And normally I never would have been granted admi admission to this meeting because I had no background in policy. I was a junior member um, of the organization, but I just was really interested in it. And so after being a scribe for a weekend where I really made those connections with the people at my table, I went over and I talked to the leadership and said, hey, you know, I really had a good time at this. And I know that the public policy committee is mostly people that are very advanced in their career, like maybe 30, 30 years down the road from where I am right now, but I really love this. Is there any way for me to kind of stay connected to this group? And they made a spot for me and they, I was the first junior member of the public policy committee and I got to travel to Washington, um, basically lobby the hill about different te technology practices and informatics and how the bills that they were passing would affect the clinicians and informatics on the ground. Um, and so that was a huge step for me, just knowing that if I volunteered, a lot of times the doors would open up. If you just say yes and just go for it, professional organizations love to kind of coach their young people along. And so just making those connections early and just saying yes. Um, other areas of AMIA I'm engaged in. So like Sherry mentioned, yes, there's a lot of times more men in the technology um, areas. Amy is really making a huge push to overcome that. There's actually an Amy and a woman in Amy, a working group who works really hard to um, nominate women for awards, to get women in leadership, to help them publish in different uh, journals, which Amy is Amy um, journal, which is the Journal of American Medical Informatics. And seeing how those different senior leadership women have really helped and stepped in to promote women in leadership. Yes, I've used it in AMIA, but I've also looked to use it in my regular career. And so that's been huge for me to have people be such a huge proponent and not just the women, but to have our male allies come in and they come to our networking things and they see, okay, how can I nominate this woman or how can I help them? That's been eye-opening and really, I think, a boost of confidence for me um, throughout my career. So I definitely recommend Every professional organization has a ton of opportunities. You can be in working groups, planning committees, conference proposal reviews, like there's always a tiny, tiny time commitment or a huge one. Um, but I recommend the professional organizations are a great spot to start when you need to build your network before you need it, like I mentioned about. Well, I love hearing that, Brittany, and, and I just have to clarify that I am not in charge of him, so that they, they allow <laughs> me to be on the board. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Brittany. This has, as usual, you know, just been so insightful and, and helpful. I know, at least for me, and I know many others. And I just want to thank you so much. You put a ton of time into preparing this, and and and, and it was just fantastic. And so we we can't just show you enough gratitude for for your time and and sharing, you know, the, your secrets.
Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, I definitely am glad that Build Her is being stood up because like I mentioned to you before, um, I think there's a lot of help for uh, people right out of college, but there's not so much for that middle career. And I'm really excited that it's being stood up right as I'm in my middle career. So I'm very glad about that. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. Uh, we'll have to, you know, handwrite you a thank you note um, for the conversation earlier. That stuck out so much to me because I am a huge proponent of it. And, you know, way back when I actually interviewed an intern candidate and he uh, actually is a really big fan of calligraphy and sending letters. So he sent like handwritten thank you notes and a wax seal on the back and everything to us. But Unlike Sherry, he did not follow through to say that we had got it. And by the time we actually got it in the mail, we'd already hired him. So it was well, bonus points. It worked out for him in the, in the long run. Um, but it was always so good to see. And I, I really appreciate you taking some time to kind of talk through this with us today. Um, and for everybody else that's joining virtually, thanks for staying tuned and uh, look out for our, our first speaker in the new year. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you.